Hello, Curran here. This video is about making a bar chart with D3 and SVG. The target audience for this video is folks who know the basics of DOM manipulation with D3 and SVG, but have no prior experience visualizing data with D3. The topics we're going to cover here include representing a data table in JavaScript, creating rectangles for each row of that data table using D3 data joins, using linear and band scales of D3, and finally adding text labels to our bars. Let's start by representing a data table in JavaScript. I came across this page on Wikipedia that I find really interesting, a list of continents by population. If we scroll down a little bit here, we can see that there's a data table that says the population of each continent as of 2018, and also the percentage of the world population that each of these continents represents. What we'd like to do is make a bar chart of this data. But the first thing we need to do is somehow get this data into our JavaScript world so that we can uh, visualize it with JavaScript. This is an HTML table, and what I'm going to do is copy that text. Then I'm going to make a new spreadsheet in Google Sheets. You may be able to use uh, Excel or other tools, but I find Google Sheets has actually really nice support for copying and pasting HTML tables. So after you've copied that HTML table, you can just paste it with Control V into here, and you get it interpreted as a table. The next thing I'm going to do is clean this up a little bit, like delete the columns that we don't really want. Because all we're really interested in here is the population and maybe the percentage of the population as well. Once we've done that, we can export it as a CSV file. We can say download as comma separated values CSV. That gives us this text file that contains the, this data in CSV format. This is what the content of that CSV file looks like. It's got continent and then population 2018. And it looks like there's an extra line break in there, so I'm just going to make that one line. So in this table, we've got three columns, continent, population 2018, and percentage of the world population. What I'm going to do next is go to VizHub and uh, fork the previous example with the SVG face. Here's our face example from a previous video. I'm going to fork this one as our starting point by clicking on fork right here. I'll change the title to making a bar chart. And I'll remove this previous description. I'm also going to remove most of the code that we wrote earlier to make our face. What we want to do next is get this CSV data into this code. So I'm going to make a new variable here. I'll say const data is a string literal so that we can have uh, new lines. And then inside of this string literal with, with the backticks, I'm just going to paste that CSV string into here. And just to be specific, I'll rename this data CSV. What we'd like to do here is transform this CSV string into an array of objects. To do this, we can import another function from D3 called CSV parse. Then we can say, OK, now const data, which is going to be an array of objects, equals CSV parse. And then we can pass in data CSV to this function, CSV parse. And let's take a look at what we've got here. We can say console.log data, and then have a look in the developer tools. We can see that, in fact, we've got this array of objects. See, each of these objects has the continent, the percentage of the world population, and the population 2018. Oh, I've still got this extra new line here. There we go. One problem here is that the world is not really a continent, so I'm just going to delete that row because we just want to look at the actual continents here. 
Another problem is that the population 2018 is a string that has commas in it. But what we really want is to make this into a number. In order to parse this into a number, we can uh, map over this array. We can say dot map right here. And then we can give it a function that takes as input d one row of the data table. And it will also return d. And inside of this function, what we can do is mutate the field that we want to mutate, which is population 2018. We want to make population 2018 into a number. So the way that we can do this is we can say d at population 2018 equals, well, we're going to access d at population 2018, and we're going to do something to this. And I'm curious if there's commas there. Does that plus notation work, that unary plus that usually parses strings to numbers? Let's see if that works. No, it doesn't. It gives us not a number. See that? N-A-N, not a number. What we really need to do is get rid of the commas first. So we can say plus, and then just to give myself more space, I'm going to put this in parentheses. We can say d at population 2016, uh, 2018 dot replace. This is a, a method on strings. So we can say, all right, replace the comma with an empty string. You know, just replace it with nothing. Let's see if that works. OK, we're still getting not a number. I'm going to remove this plus just to see what these strings are that we're getting out. And see, it's just replacing the first comma of these commas. We can replace all commas by using a regular expression here. We can say slash comma slash and then add g to make it global so it's going to do a global search and replace replacing all commas with empty strings and let's see if this worked all right the, there's no commas in these so we can add that plus back here and now we should be getting numbers out all right it looks like we've got our numbers While we're at it, let's also parse these numbers, the percentage of world population. So I'm going to copy this string here, percentage of world pop. And then in the code, I'm going to use that. I'm just going to copy paste this logic here. And instead of population 2018, we're going to reassign percentage of world pop to be plus percentage of world pop. And if we leave out this replace, does it work? Does that give us what we need? Let's take a look. OK, it's not a number. I think that's because there's a percent sign. So we can do the same thing here. And because there's only one percent sign, it doesn't need to be a regular expression. So we can say replace the percentage sign with an empty string and then parse that. Let's see, does that work? All right. That seems to work. Great. Although we're still getting not a number for Antarctica. What is that? If I leave out this plus, what's that string for Antarctica that we're ending up with? Oh no, it's a less than, it's a less than. Hmm. Well, how are we supposed to visualize that? I think I'll just get rid of this less than symbol. So in addition to replacing this, we can, we can actually chain replace. And we can say, all right, also replace the less than symbol with the empty string. Now if we take a look at our values, they're all numbers that should be parsable. So if we add that plus back here, we should be properly parsing everything. All right, that looks great. By the way, I just want to clarify why we're using the square brackets here. Um, if we tried to use dot, which is, you know, similar conceptually, um, and omit these quotes, 
This only works with property names that have no spaces and no weird characters. Um, for example, you know, P-E-R-C-E-N-T, percent. That would work just fine. But because the property name has um, spaces and strange characters, we need to use the square bracket notation with quotes like this in order for it to work. All right, so now that we've parsed this data, one thing I'd like to do before we move on is to refactor this into a separate module so it's not in the same file as our visualization logic. To do this, I'm going to click on New File, and I'll say, I'll call it data.js. And then I'm going to cut this stuff out of there and paste it into data.js. In here, we're using CSV parse, so we need to import that from D3, and we don't need it in our index.js anymore. So I'm going to paste that line up here, import just CSV parse from D3, and this value is really what we want to export, so I'm going to say export const data equals, you know, this expression here. And then back in index.js, we can import data from dot slash data. And now it should still log out that very same data. All right, looks like it works. Great. All right, so we've represented a data table in JavaScript. Next, let's create rectangles for each row of this table using D3. Let's make a rectangle for each of these rows in the table. And I'll get rid of this console.log data. We don't need that anymore. To do this, we can say svg.select all rect. This will select all the existing rectangles that are there on the page, and at this time there are none. But this is part of D3's data join. We have to, we have to know what rectangles are there in the first place in order to know um, how the data that we pass in differs from this initial selection. To construct a data join, we can say dot data data after we say select all. This creates what's called a D3 data join. Once we've created this data join, we can call dot enter here. And this creates a new selection that corresponds to the data elements that are there that do not correspond to any existing DOM elements. So in this case, there are no existing DOM elements, no existing rectangles, so this enter selection corresponds to all the data elements, all the entries of our data table. We could think of this as the, the things that are sort of entering the scene. And so on the enter selection, we want to append new rectangles. This will append a new rectangle for each row of our table. And we're not seeing anything because we need to give these rectangles some attributes like width and height. So for all of these newly appended rectangles, we can say dot attr and we can give it a width of, I don't know, let's say 50 and also a height of 50. See, now we can at least see something. And in fact, there are multiple rectangles, but we can't really tell because they're all on top of each other. When we call .attr on a data join, or a selection that has multiple elements, we can pass in, instead of a value, we can pass in a function. And so let's try to spread these out uh, going from top to bottom so that we can see that there's multiple rectangles here. To do that, we can use the y attribute. We can say dot attr y. And here we can pass a function. I'm going to use an arrow function here. The function that we use here takes as input two arguments. The first argument is typically called d just by convention. And this refers to one of our objects in the array. 
And the second argument is the index of that object in that array, starting at zero. And that's typically called i. Let's use i to compute the y attribute. So we can return i, but i goes from like, I don't know, zero to six or whatever. So to spread this out, we can multiply i by, let's say, 60. Now we've got a nice spread of rectangles here. And to make it look more like a bar chart, I'm going to make these uh, wider. Let's say 300 pixels, or I don't know, 500 pixels. All right, we've created rectangles for each of our rows in the data table using D3 data joins. Next, let's use linear and band scales to make it really more like a bar chart and have the rectangles be different sizes. What we want to do next here is make these rectangles different lengths depending on the data. In the data, let's see, I think we want to make it based on the population, 2018. So to access this, we can say d at population 2018. So in our index.js, let's say, all right, the width of these is going to be a function of d and we can just return d at um, population 2018. Fix that a little bit. But these numbers are not pixels, it's number of people. Uh, but if we say divide by 500 or 5,000 or five, uh, 5 million, we start to, okay, now it sort of looks like a bar chart. Now we're getting the relative scale of these different populations. But we don't want to be guessing about this. I mean, what we really want to do is divide by the maximum population. There's a construct in D3 uh, called a scale that is designed for dealing with exactly this. So let's import scale linear, linear scale from D3. And also, we're going to need to compute the maximum population. And there's also a D3 utility for that, which is called max. A scale is responsible for converting numbers from what I like to think of as data space, and in this case, it's the population values, into what I like to think of as screen space or pixel coordinates, You know, values that make sense to pass into, for example, width here. To begin with scales, let's make a new variable called x scale. We can say x scale equals scale linear. And we invoke scale linear as a function to create a new instance of the scale. And once we've got this instance of the scale, we can set the domain and range. So let's begin by setting the domain by calling dot domain. The domain of a scale is um, it's the extent of values in the data space that we want to deal with. And for a linear scale, this takes as input an array of two elements. And we want the zero point of our bars to correspond to zero in the data. This is a zero baseline. And we want the maximum to correspond to the maximum population value. And so to compute that, we can say, all right, uh, let's use max from D3. And max will compute the maximum value over the first argument that we give it, which is our data array, using the function that we pass in as the second argument. And this, again, is a function that takes as input one row, D, and we can return d at population 2018. So what this does is it evaluates this function for each row of the data table, and it computes the maximum of all those returned values. And this is what we want to use as the second value for our domain of the x scale. We can again use console.log to take a look at what we've actually computed here. We can say console.log x scale dot domain. See, if we don't pass anything in to domain, it will actually return the domain that we've set. 
So if we open up the DevTools, we take a look here, we can say, all right, this is the domain of our X scale. It goes from zero to this number, which looks correct as the maximum value for the population of any given uh, continent. Next, let's set the range of our scale by calling dot range on our scale. This also takes as input an array with two elements, uh, the first of which is going to be zero, and the second of which we're going to use um, width. Because if the data value is zero, it should correspond to a bar width of zero. But if the data value is the maximum value, that should correspond to the full width available on our SVG. Now we've set up the scale completely so that if we invoke it as a function and we pass in a value from the domain, it will return the corresponding value in the range. So now, instead of uh, dividing our population by some random number that we come up with, we can just invoke the x scale and pass in d at population 2018. All right, this is working. But there is sort of this duplicated logic. We've got this function that returns d at population 2018, and we've also got it down here. What I like to typically do is make a function that returns this value and then use that function in different places. So that if we wanted to change it to uh, you know, visualize something else, we could just change it in one place and we wouldn't have to change it in many places. What I'm going to do is copy this function definition right here. I'm going to cut it actually and replace it with x value. And then define const x value equals this function here that returns d at population 2018. This is effectively the same as passing in that inline function here, but we're just extracting it to a variable. Now, instead of saying x scale of d at population 2018, we can say x scale of the x value of d. We've got to pass in d. All right, this is looking more like a bar chart, and this is how we can use linear scales to compute how uh, wide each of these bars should be. But we're still doing something a little hacky, which is multiplying i by 60 here. Instead of uh, trying to hack together this function here that computes the y, and also guessing at the height of these bars, there's actually a nice construct in D3 called a band scale and we can import that as scale band. Just like we create an x scale as scale linear, we can say const y scale is an instance of scale band. And on this scale, the domain we can set as actually the array of values that represent each bar. So first, let's make the function um, that accesses these values. We can say const y value is a function that takes as input d, one row, and returns d at, well, what should this really be? If we look at the data, this really should be continent. That's really what each bar represents. Each bar represents one continent. So we can say, okay, for the y value, re return the continent. And the y scale domain should be an array that just contains all of these continents. To compute that, we can use map again. We can say data.map, a function that takes as input d and returns y value of d. But this actually is a, is a degenerate statement, you know, because this function here is the same thing as y value. It takes as input d and it returns y value of d. So we can just pass in y value like this. And let's take a look at what we've got by saying console.log yscale.domain. This is the array that we get, Asia, Africa, Europe, 
All right, it looks like it worked. It's all the continents from our data. Now we can use that Y scale when we make our rectangles. Instead of this function here, we can make a function that takes as input one row, D, and it will return the Y scale of the Y value of D. The same pattern as we're using for the width. Oh, but they're still all on top of each other because I forgot to set the range. We can set the range to be, again, an array of two numbers. And it could go from, say, 0 to height. Oops, <laughs> not range, range. I misspelled it there. All right, we've got our bars back. This looks great. And now we can even use the Y scale for the height uh, because it computes what's known as bandwidth. We can say Y scale dot bandwidth. And that will give us an even spacing um, that's data driven. It computes this based on the number of elements there in the data. To control the spacing of these bars, Scale band has another method called padding. We can set the padding to be, say, 0 0.1. That will give us a bit of spacing. And if we set it to larger numbers, we get more spacing. So let's set the padding to be 0 0.1 here for our bars. We've used linear and band scales to create our bars, but we don't know what these bars mean. So let's add some text labels to these bars. What we want to do here is add a text label for each one of these rectangles. And the logic we need is quite similar to this logic for adding rectangles. So I'm going to just copy paste that and change rect to text. Text is a certain kind of uh, element in SVG that will just append, uh, it'll just show you text on the screen. So we can say svg.select all text dot enter dot append text um, and width and height it doesn't make sense for text but the y attribute does and also to to show the actual text in there we can say dot text which is the text content of the dom node this is another method on d3 selections and what we want to put as the text is actually the y value so we can say, all right, this is going to be a function that takes as input d, and it returns the y value of d. And see, all right, there we go. We got some text showing up. Antarctica, Oceania. Uh, but again, this is sort of a degenerate statement. We may as well just pass in y value directly. So we've got the essentials here. and. From here on out, it's a matter of tweaking it uh, to look nice and be readable. We have a choice when setting things like the font size and the font color of, you know, should we do it in the JavaScript or should we do it in CSS? And I find that using CSS for this sort of thing is more um, comfortable in general and especially as the complexity scales. So I'm just going to use CSS rather than setting attributes on the text. So we can use some CSS. To select all text elements on the screen, we can just use text as our selector. And then we can say, uh, we can, for example, change the font size. Font-size is going to be, I don't know, 2EM to make it double what it normally would be. And that works fairly well. But how about we? Uh, we put the labels inside of the bars and we make them white. That way that we could read them on top of the bars. So we could say font, um, or n no, not font, but just color is white. Well, that didn't work. Uh, maybe we could set the fill to be white. There we go. Now everything is white. But to position these inside the bars, uh, we need to go back to JavaScript. Right now, the text is positioned on top 
of the bars, but what we want to do is position it in the middle. And one thing to note is that the Y coordinate that we specify is the bottom of the text. So let's start by moving that to the center of the bar. We can do that by modifying this function here to return Y scale of Y value of D plus Y scale dot bandwidth divided by two. That'll get us to the center. There's some problem here. We're getting not a number. I'm not sure why that is. If I remove this, then it works. If I add, let's say, five, that works. If I add just y scale dot bandwidth. Oh, maybe bandwidth needs to be called as a function. Yeah, that's what it is. Whoops. Yeah, it's a function that gives you the width of each individual band. All right, so now, now that we've got that number, we can divide it by two. That puts the baseline of our text in the center of the bars. To change the alignment baseline, we can go back to CSS. And uh, this is uh, another property that we can use, alignment-baseline. We can say, I believe it's middle. Yeah, that will center them in these bars. One problem that we have is that we can't see the text outside of the bars, but for that we can set the stroke of the text to be, let's say, black. Okay, that sort of works, but I think I'd like to go for a, a different kind of a design, like what if we put the text on top of the bars? Let's, let's try that. So let's get rid of the stroke, the alignment baseline, and we leave the fill as black, and we position these on top of the bars. So instead of adding the bandwidth over by two, we can just keep it like this, and we can adjust the padding to give more space so that we can read these values here. And let's separate the text a bit from the bars by subtracting, say, three pixels. And we can tweak the padding a bit more. And I think what I'd like to see here is really the number as well. So like Asia has how many people? I mean, this the bars show us the relative size, but we could show it in the text as well. For that, we can modify the text to be a function that takes as input D, and it returns Y value of D, but also, you know, we can put that into a string, a, a string template literal, where it, re it returns the Y value of D, and then puts a colon, and then a space, and then we return also the X value of D. So that can show us the actual numbers here. And it's funny because for the computation we wanted to get rid of the commas, but when we present these numbers back, we actually want to add those commas back in because it makes the numbers more readable. D3 has a utility called format that we can import here. And I always need to consult the documentation for D3 format. D3 dash format is the package. And this is how we use it. We pass in this string specifier, and I believe you can just pass in a comma, and then it will give you back a function that you can pass a number into, and then it will return the formatted string. So before we add the text, we can say make a const uh, comma format equals format, which is the D3 function. And I think we can just pass in comma here. And then instead of just outputting X value of D, we can output comma format of X value of D. See, now we've got these nice commas here. Now I think I'll just do a few more tweaks of the CSS. We can make the font a bit smaller, like let's say 1.7 EM, and we can make the font family different. 
let's use um, sans. Yeah, it looks a bit different, a bit more readable. I don't know, more stylish. Let's make it a bit smaller, and I like to make it a bit gray. So we can say the fill, let's set the fill to be gray. Or, I don't know, let's use a color picker to get a nice gray. So I think this is more like the gray that I'd like. So I can copy that hex over here into the CSS. And that's what we've got, a presentation of the number of people in each continent. And notice how there's like so many people in Asia, but there's only, is that right, a thousand people around in Antarctica? It makes the bar so small that you can't even see it. But anyway, I think this presents the data fairly well, fairly nicely. And it gives you a definitely a sense of the relative scale. All right, now I've got an exercise for you. I would like you to create maybe your first visualization ever by forking this visualization and just changing the data. Change this data here and everything should nicely flow through the code um, to change the meaning of this visualization. So, you know, find some data that's interesting for you that has, you know, less than 10 values. And each of those values should have some name and some number that goes along with it. But it could be any topic, really, any topic at all. Um, so that's the assignment for you. Change the data in this to make a new bar chart. And you can get started by just clicking fork right here. Make sure you cite the source of your data, too. Actually, that's something I forgot to do. I'm going to do that by copying this link and then editing the readme here and say something like, this bar chart shows the population of each continent. The data comes from Wikipedia colon, and I'll paste that URL there, and then I'll go to this article and uh, copy the title of it into this link, Wikipedia colon list of, con list of continents by population, and it shows up down here. That's all for making a bar chart with D3 and SVG. Thanks for watching. Take care.